Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us for this study time and invite you to stay tuned to our programming at 10.30, 11 o'clock, our worship service. And then again this evening, if you want to tune in, 6 o'clock uh, for our evening service Bible study. Uh, we are looking at passages from Ecclesiastes. We've been in this study for about five weeks, and we will conclude that study next week before we begin another study. We've been talking about Solomon, the wisest man in the world. God gave him the gift of wisdom, and he went out on a pursuit of trying to find the meaning of life. What's life all about? What will bring pleasure? What will bring happiness? What will bring contentment to your life. And he had a hard time finding those kinds of things. Everywhere he looked, it turned out to be meaningless, meaningless. What value is life? What does life mean? So today we're looking at chapter 5, Ecclesiastes, verses 10 through 20. And as most people today would find contentment and meaning in life would be funds, money, valuables, whatever it might be. They think that brings contentment, brings happiness, brings this, brings that. And of course, as, the, the, um, as he calls himself the preacher uh, or the teacher, he finds that really it's meaningless unless you use it in the right way. So we're going to look at wealth and what that involves in the lives of people beginning with verse 10 through 12. And then we'll talk about <clears throat> what that is and what it means. So it says, Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. Uh, there's a passage in 1 Timothy 6.10 that uh, tells us about that. Uh, and then it's verse 11 says, As goods increase... <laughs> So do those with, who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. So that brings up a lot of topics there, as we all could think about and um, think about. Uh, back in years, many, many years ago, coins were not available. Coins did not come until after 700 B.C. So people who collected gold and silver just had it in whatever form it was in, whether it was a chunk or a bar or whatever they could make out of it. No coins. Uh, so people, if they carried that around, it was kind of heavy, wasn't it? If you had a pocket full of gold, it would bring a lot. Uh, but anyway, he says, He who loves money will never be satisfied with money. Um, We've talk, mentioned that just a moment ago. How much is enough? You know, how much is enough? Well, the answer is just a dollar more. How much is enough? Just a dollar more, a dollar more, a dollar more to keep on. Um, let me read that first Timothy passage, and I think you all recognize this uh, as to what it is. As soon as I find it. Uh, it says 610. It says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So uh, money can bring griefs along with happiness or joy or whatever you use it for if we use it in the right way. So a person may become more and more, a person may become more um, uh, meaningful with what he claims he has but he never has quite enough. There's always that quest for more and more and more and more. Today's society, there are people that have more money than maybe some countries around the world have. Uh, this is the age of the billionaires, and soon, if it keeps on going, there'll be trillionaires in the country or in the world. So more and more people want more and have more. So it never brings a satisfaction uh, and we'll talk about the opposite of that later on as we get into it. So, he who loves wealth is never satisfied. This is meaningless. What good is gold, silver, money, however, whatever possessions we have that would make us uh, uh, have enough to do whatever we want to do with um, is difficult to think about. If we don't use it in the right way, 
and use it for some purpose, uh, then we can't find anything meaningful to that. And it says, as goods increase, so to those who consume them. <laughs> and we know what that means. If, if uh, especially for people who win the lottery or hit it big, you know what happens, don't you? You have a lot of family that you didn't know you had. You have a lot of friends that you didn't have because they want to help you with that. They want to help you spend it and get some advantage out of that. So you always have an entourage. Uh, you see some of these, um, uh, especially athletes, they have an entourage. If they have a lot of money made from their sport, uh, they always have an entourage. People who they have to keep up. They have to have bodyguards. They have to have this. They have to have that. Um, my grandson's out in Aspen, Colorado, where the ski industry is, and he took this family to the airport the other day. And uh, it was a man, a wife, two children, a cook, and a nanny. Took them out to the uh, airport, and there was this big private jet they were going to get on, take off. So, you know, had a lot of accumulation. Maybe they were getting a little joy out of that. <laughs> had a teacher in high school, a history teacher, he said, the root of uh, money is the root of all evil, but he said, I'd like to have a little bit of that root. <laughs> so people have all kind of notions about what money does and what money will do. But the teacher here says, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. So you have a lot of folks who want to tag along, be your friend, be your ex, a long lost cousin, or kin folks from way back, they want to share in that. Uh, when, um, uh, oh, just recently, oh, phooey, just, I can't think of it. This guy died and suddenly has a lot of ex-wives out there <laughs> who are really not the ex-wives, but they want to try to get some of that money that he's leaving behind. So people are always out to get what you might have or share what you might have to do. So he says, uh, what benefit are they to the owner? What good does he get out of that? Having to entertain people or have people hanging around or having to buy people food or whatever it is that do. What do they get out of it? Well, they don't really get anything out of it, as it says, except to feast his eyes on them, <laughs> except to watch them eat up his food or spend his money or whatever they do to do that. So you don't get a whole lot uh, from that, as he says. So what benefit are they? The owner's pictured as helpless. You just stand by and watch that happen and watch people uh, take what you have. Helpless, he stands by to watch. It says, uh, uh, what can the owners do when they watch other people eat their goods, eat up what they have and what they have worked for? Uh, nothing but to feast their eyes on them. And then it says, uh, the sleep of a laborer is sweet. Whether he eats a little bit or much, he doesn't know how much he's going to have. He may not have enough money, provide enough food for to go around for his family. So, but he still sleeps good because he worked all day. He's tired. He sleeps. But it says the rich man, um, uh, the abundance of rich man permits him no sleep. He worries about his possessions. Anything could happen. Uh, stock market could suddenly drop. The commodities market should drop down and go to the bottom. Anything can happen. A flood, the floods, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes can come and wipe stuff out in just a short period of time. Uh, so you worry about what you got. You want to guard it. You want to protect it. You want to insure it. You want to seal it up so nobody can break it in, break in and steal what you got, and so forth and so on. So it's difficult. You worry about what tomorrow's going to bring? Am I going to still have this or something going to happen? I'm going to lose it. Or any other means by which people can lose things could appear and could happen uh, to us. So sleep is nice and constant anxiety are really not good for a person's well-being. Um, I don't know about the farmer when it rains day and day and day and... <laughs> It's kind of hard to sleep. When's this rain going to stop? Will I be able to get back to work? Is this going to happen? That going to happen? All these kinds of things. So in any work or anything, those kinds of things can suddenly uh, appear. Um, 
you know, a fellow may have a job or a woman may have a job that, that pays really good money and they're making good income, and all of a sudden the company has a layoff or the company's sold to another company and you lose your job as a result of that, uh, anything can happen. Uh, I remember my brother worked for pharmaceuticals all of his life, and he was in the corporate office and had a really good job, but they started cutting back. And he was the one who has to call people and say, you don't have a job, you don't have a job, you don't have a job. Finally, the president called him in one day, and he said, I know what you're gonna say, just go ahead and say it, you don't have a job. So, <laughs> and he was 55 years old, so where's a 55-year-old man go to get a job? Fortunately, he hooked on with another company and was able to work till he retired. But that doesn't happen to everybody. So you never know. There's always anxiety about what's out there, what's going to happen. And some people get sick over it. Some people have to take medication to try to keep calm and to deal with the issues that come up in life and all the difficult things that happen. So the love of money is the root of all evil. If that's our main goal and focus in our life, sometimes money can even become our God, that that's all we worship, that's all we it consumes us and our time is more and more and more and more. So what do you do with more? I think uh, as we get older, money, and aside from enough money to take care of us if we get sick and that kind of thing, uh, our, our desire for more and more is not there anymore. It kind of passes through. Uh, and it may not be true for, for y'all, but that's kind of the way I approach it. It's just not meaningful to me to have more and more and more um, for the sake of having more and more. To, to, to make that my desire, my everyday accomplishment, is go out there and get more, get more stuff and do that. Anyway, uh, so Paul was convinced that the love of money is the root of evil. Uh, love of money is uh, the Greek word for covetousness or avarice. Greed. Greed can set in. You remember the Donald Duck's uncle? What was his name? Y'all remember him? Scrooge. Scrooge, yeah. He just liked to sit in his vault and count his money and throw it up in the air and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so greed can set in and make you make that your God and you want to accumulate as much as you can and just have it. Just to have it. To know you got it. And to do that. All right. We'll move on to the other verse. As soon as I can turn the page here, excuse me, uh, to do that. So, um, another scripture in Luke 12, 15 says, Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So, that can't be just our life, our whole life, our whole quest for whatever. We can't count on that. We need to uh, focus on other things, serving the Lord doing what he would ask us to do. Then in verses 13 to 17, he goes on to talk about wealth offers no guarantee of security. And I've already touched on that as I've talked about this already. So let me read verses 13 to 17. It says, I've seen a grievous evil under the sun. And of course, he uses that phrase under the sun all the way through, uh, which means uh, a way of saying, while living on this earth, I see these things, I've experienced these things, I know these things. So... Under the sun means we're living under the sun through our lifetime to do that. So he says, I've seen a grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. This too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs. And what does he gain, since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. So this would be referring to a man whose goal is to have everything and to hold on to it. And, and so the writer of, uh, Solomon here says, you can't do that. You, um, as he says, Wealth hoarded, the word hoarded, to the harm of its owner, or lost through some misfortune. Uh, we know about hoarders. I don't know y'all. There's a TV program called Hoarders. I don't know whether y'all watch that or not. I don't watch it. I know about it. 
Uh, but there are people who hoard. It may not be money and treasures, but it'd be stuff. As Billy Breathen said years ago, I don't need any more stuff at this point in life. I don't want any more stuff. So we all have a lot of stuff and some to excess when they try to hoard. And that's what he's saying. Somebody has a lot of treasure and he wants, just wants to hoard it. Life's not very comfortable, not very pleasant because you're always worrying about it. you're going to lose it. It won't stay with you for some reason. So that's the problem that sometimes accompanies wealth that brings that problem. Uh, uh, the idea of um, grievous evil under the sun, riches being kept for the owners, there, therefore thereof to their hurt. Uh, hoarded. We just know the picture of hoarding. A person would have great wealth, but they're stingy, and they don't want to share it with anybody. They want to hold on to it. Generous, who are willing to take care of others and help others, <coughs> especially their own family. Uh, some people don't even want to help take care of their family. They want to hold on <coughs> excuse me, to what they have and keep it. So the, the hurt, the tragic evil that he talks about here, it makes it difficult to hoard it and not to be willing to share or let it be useful for something that would be helpful to other people. Contributions to church, contributions to school, contributions to helping agencies that help people with uh, food or whatever it is, whatever it is. Help people in some way to let that money be a blessing to others. So God blesses us <clears throat> so that we can use what he has blessed us with to help other people. It's not intentional for us to keep it all. We are to share it. It's like the, like the kids uh, splitting up something. It's one for you and two for me. <laughs> one for you and two for me. Uh, you want to fill up your pocket and get more than the other people, other people have or need. Well, uh, the preacher message is a stark reminder of the foolishness of relying on just wealth to do that. Because he says, <clears throat> we've heard this verse forever and forever, naked a man comes from the mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. So that, we don't take anything with us when we leave. The old joke is uh, funeral possessions going down the road, and there was an armored car at the back of it. And somebody said, oh, they must have figured out a way to take it with him. <laughs> he was trying to take some with him. But we came. We leave with just what we came into the world. Nothing. Nothing in our hands when we leave. So the question is, well, what did that person leave? As if they had an estate. They're going to leave them. Well, the answer is he left, he, he left everything. He didn't leave. He didn't take it with him. He left it all behind. Somebody else will get it and use it for a while. Then they too will pass on and they will leave everything behind. There will be nothing to take with us as we go. And then he says, all of his days, he's so... Uh, uh, he's so uptight about keeping this wealth and hoarding it and not sharing it. <clears throat> he has a lot of uh, days where he eats in darkness. There's nobody there to share with him. Uh, he doesn't want to even share it with a family or anybody else. So what profit is he who has struggled for the wind? That is the wind as the wind blows. Uh, the labor for the wind. What's he going to do with it? What meaning? He's going to be eating by himself. Like Scrooge, we know the story of Scrooge. He uh, was by himself, even though he had a, some family. Even though he didn't want to share anything that he had, he wanted to hold on to it until he had a vision to say, I, I better start sharing what I have with other people. So our riches can be lost. We can lose them one way or another. We can lose them. The benefits of riches are temporary at best. You know, we have, have it today. We know of a lot of people who've had riches at one time, but for whatever reason, they've lost it. You know, the business didn't go well. They lost it. They don't have it anymore. So that's kind of sad when we come to that uh, place. So we can control our wealth while we live, but when we die, we lose control. We no longer decide where that... Uh, stack of money or riches, whatever it might be, is going to go. It could disappear. You may have worked hard all your life to accumulate something and then you die and you leave it on to your beneficiaries. You leave it to a son or a daughter. Next thing you know, they run through it. It's all gone. 
There it went. You work all your life for that, and it's all gone in just a short time. Then in verses 18 to 20, he goes on to say, uh, Then I realized that it's good and proper for man to eat and drink, and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and to be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Now that's an important verse I'll come back to in just a minute. So it is good for a person that has wealth or whatever person has to be able to enjoy it that that's not his focus and drive every day to accumulate more and more. He uses it for his family, he may use it to help others, whatever he does with it, it's good. It's good and proper for man to be able to eat and to drink and to find satisfaction in his labor. You go out there and work all season and you accumulate something at the end of the season, you know, you enjoy it. If you work hard, you enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying. God doesn't say that it's bad to have wealth. It's just the, how we treat wealth and how we use wealth and how we um, consider wealth to be a help, help, helping source of things rather than to keep it for ourselves, being willing to help family and friends and whatever. So the preacher doesn't condemn wealth. He's not saying it's bad. As communists would say, we're going to take all your wealth and then we're going to help everybody. Like the discussion of today, socialism. It's a big topic of discussion. Socialism. We're going to take more and more of what you have, and then we're going to help everybody and give them a little bit of this and give them this kind of service and that kind of government's going to take care of you. Make sure you have everything you need. Well, that's not true that we see. So he doesn't condemn it, but rather he condemns a life lived for the sake of wealth. So if we're just living to accumulate things uh, the preacher here is condemning it, and so does, so does God. Well, uh, proper. It's good and proper for one to eat and to drink, to enjoy the good of all his labor. So we think of Thanksgiving time of the year, uh, when we celebrate Thanksgiving, that we give God thanks for whatever he has blessed us with. Food, family, shelter, work, employment, and so forth. Those are good things to thank God for because he provides that for us through his blessings to do, to do that. Well, to paraphrase, it's pleasant and fitting to the person who eats the food and drinks <coughs> and drink he's been given and to enjoy all the benefits that's come through that has come from God that he has blessed us with, which God gives him. They are his portion. And so people who treat treasures, wealth, in a meaningful way, give God credit for blessing them to that point. Uh, that place is a lot in life, and that's why I like um, verse 20. Um, it says, life is so pleasant, and we accept it as a gift from God, that we seldom reflect on the days of his life, of our lives, because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. So, any age, we, especially in older age, we don't think about the years, the few years out there to when we die. We are enjoying life as it is now and the blessings that God has given to us. And that's a good thought that I didn't think about. We are grateful because of what God provides us and we are happy and joyful in what he has blessed us with and we use it in the right way. We're not reflecting about whenever, a year from now, 10 years from now, whenever, that this life will come to an end and we leave here. Uh, we, we use that, that, what God has given to us, and we bless him for that. In everything, in all things, every circumstance, in any and every situation, uh, Paul says, uh, I'm quoting one, in Philippians 4.12, Paul says, I know how to be abased. Uh, I know what it is to have a lot. I know what it is to have a little. And if we have a choice, we're going to say we were somewhere, somewhere in between. Hopefully we can be somewhere. We don't want to be without, of all things. We don't necessarily want an abundance, but we want somewhere that would be happy for us and to make do. So he says, I know how to make do with a little. 
know how to make do with a lot. Have y'all ever made do with a little? <laughs> yeah. I remember the last uh, senior year of college, Jerry and I were married, and uh, we would go to the grocery store and we'd buy a two potatoes and a half pound of hamburger. That'd be our meal. <laughs> so, so we knew it was to have a little bit, and I guess we've known a little bit about it is to have more than that through the years. So we know what it is. We, we adjust to it. We make do with it. And we get by until things can get better or we can do things about it. And then, of course, Paul says uh, in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we can, if we have the right attitude towards what God has blessed us with and given to us and made us stewards. Scripture talks about that we are stewards, caretakers of what God has blessed us with. And so we're to take care of it in the proper manner, which brings reflection to God and His glory and what He's done for us. So that's why we do that. So I think that um, the preacher or uh, Solomon, he came to that conclusion that, hey, without God, life is meaningless. There's nothing there. We go through life day by day. We may have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but what pleasure, what joy does it bring? If we do it in the, in the uh, depending on God, those things can help us to reflect on what we have, what he's given us, and how we are to use it, and how we give him thanks for everything. So God is the one in charge, and we are to recognize that. So whether we have a lot of stuff or not much stuff or somewhere in between, we are to bless God and live a life. As he says, reflect on the days of our lives because God keeps us occupied with gladness of heart. So, thank you for being here this morning. As we close out this passage, we'll pick up another passage next week to close out, and that will be uh, in chapter 11 where Paul says, Paul, Solomon says he finds full contentment what the meaning of life is, as he says. So we'll pick up there next week. Thanks for being here today. Join us again for our worship service in a few moments and again next week. Hope you have a great week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for helping us to learn the lessons of what life is all about. That it's all about you, not about us. You're the one who blesses us. You're the one who guides us through life and all of life's experiences. So we pray that we may be able to use whatever you have blessed us with to have a joyful life and to reflect upon what you've blessed us with and to use it for the sake of helping others along the way. Go with us now as we leave. Help us to serve and honor you in all that we do and wherever we go whoever we encounter, that we will be faithful to share the gospel of Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.